morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I'm so happy to see you here and thank you for taking this time to come and join us this morning for worship. I invite you to please let us open this time of praise with a prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we come today and some of us are carrying burdens. We pray for a lightening of the load. We pray for your presence upon our hearts as we sing our prayers and our praise and our love for you, knowing and receiving the love you give us, especially in this meal of forgiveness we receive today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can find most of your announcements for the week in the messenger, the lavender insert you can pick up on the way in or out. Uh, 
One thing to note is we will begin a grief share group starting August 14th. It's a 13-week uh, course, really is a support group, and there's, there's um, topics for each evening. But if you are experiencing grief in your life, this is a, a great opportunity to find an intentional support um, to be there for you. And they will be beginning in August. And then also, just a reminder um, that if you have some musical talents and would like to share them, uh, please talk to the band because we would love to, um, to experience that. So, yeah. So with that, I believe we have our opening song. So let us sing. Please stand. Living together in trust and hope, we proclaim our faith. We believe in one God, in three persons, a triple bloom on a single stem. God the Father, who created the universe and is continually creating us. God the Son, who redeemed us by coming and pitching his tent next to ours. God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us and is the love that gives our life meaning. We worship one God in three, and three in one. In this belief is life everlasting.
case you're wondering, Kyrie eleison means Lord have mercy. <laughs> so Lord have mercy on our world and every day. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Every day of our lives, we sin against you with our actions and our inability to act, as well as our hurtful words of painful silence. We continually drop the ball. Sin has consumed our lives, and there are a lot of things we have not done but should be doing to glorify your name. We have held back from loving you fully. We have focused on loving ourselves, and with what we have left, we have not reached out to our neighbors. Your son sacrificed and died for us. Show us your mercy, forgive our sins, refresh our hearts, and guide us through our days. We love you and want to be like you. We are thankful for your grace so that our sins do not permanently separate us from you. Amen. May you receive now the entire forgiveness of all your sins by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Romans. Romans 8, 26 through 39. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the hearts, knows that what is the mind of the Spirit? Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died. Yes, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may, ah, uh, the peace of Christ be with you always. You may take this time to share the peace with each other. Okay, this time I invite any kids to come forward. Children's sermon. I kind of need to stand up for this one, so. All right, so do you guys know what this is? Yeah? yeah? What is it? It's a kind of a game. Yeah, you play telephone, right? I'm gonna, do you want to be my helper? Since you know how, to, how it kind of works, you guys? Okay, so you got one person on one end, and you got the other holding it to the ear, and you tuck. And then I can hear it. Somebody want to come and see what it sounds like when someone does that? Yeah. So you hold it up to your ear, and he's going to talk to you. Isn't that cool? Anybody else? Yeah. Well, this morning scripture says that the Holy Spirit will lift up our prayers to God. Even when we don't even know what to pray for and we don't have words, even our sighs, the Spirit will send to God. And Spirit's kind of like this string, right? And the idea of how this works, right, is you hold the the string tight between the two cups and there's vibrations that go and that's how come the person can hear it when you're talking and see so you just hold this and the vibrations go along the string well the spirit kind of works that way to we know that God hears our prayers we know God hears our prayers and the spirit is like this little vibrating string making sure God hears us so let's have a quick prayer you guys before we Go and you guys can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for hearing our prayers and for the Spirit who speaks for us. 
when we don't know what to say. Thank you. Amen. Thanks. So as I've been working with transitional ministry, so um, working when churches are going through a change in leadership or um, really any kind of changes, but that's what transitional leadership works with. Um, It's made me think about Lent, believe it or not. Lent is a season of the year. It's 40 days long, and it is, well, actually, it's a little longer than that because we don't count Sundays, but it's 40 days um, that we call Lent, and it's this time leading up to Easter. And it's a time that begins with a kind of um, sobering sense of, um, of ending, right? It begins with Ash Wednesday, in which we uh, say the words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It's kind of a, a morbid sense of, here we are dust, and to dust we shall return. So it kind of gets you in this spot, <laughs> where you spend the next five weeks in preparation, in transition, Uh, The season of Lent usually centers around repentance, service, self-denial, and intentional refocusing on God, being intentional. Then we get up to Holy Week, in which we recognize the events of Palm Sunday, the Lord's Supper of Forgiveness, Christ's crucifixion on Good Friday, and the resurrection of Jesus. Lent is a term that comes from Old English, uh, the word lengthen, and it means, kind of like it sounds, to lengthen. Lent's a season that is a time of transition in the church year, but also just in the world and in life, because we're transitioning uh, from from seasons, from winter to spring. Our days are getting longer at that time. The weather, hopefully, is getting warmer. And so all around that time is this sense of change. Change is happening. Change is coming. And with change and transition times in our lives, there is a kind of loudness that happens. It gets really loud. It gets really scary, right? Because we don't know where things are going exactly. We can't predict. We can't say exactly. And so that can increase our sense of fear, anxiety. And you know what happens when we get anxious? We get really tense. And we get tense in our bodies, maybe our neck hurts or our head hurts, or we can get tense mentally um, and emotionally and experience a spiral of depression, and that's pain, right? And so there's actually a term for that. It's called the fear tense uh, pain cycle, the fear tension pain cycle. It's an actual thing. And basically, you feel anxiety because you don't know what's going to happen. You get really tense, and then you feel pain because you're really tense, and then you worry about your pain, so then you feel more fear and anxiety, and then you get more tense, and then you feel more pain, and then you get worried about the pain, and you want it to go away. And it's this cycle, and it just goes, and you can just feel it just talking about it, right? Well, blogger... Sarah Bessie talks about this in a blog that she wrote um, earlier this spring. And she invites us to lean into the pain when experiencing this fear, tension, pain cycle. So here's what she wrote in her blog. Stay there in the questions, in the doubts, in the wonderings, and loneliness the tensions of living in the now and not yet of the kingdom of God. Your wounds and hurts and aches until you are satisfied that Abba is there too. 
You may not find your answers by ignoring the cries of your heart or by living your life of intellectual and spiritual dishonesty. Your fear will try to hold you back. Your tension will increase. The pain will become intense, and it will be tempting to keep clinging to the way things always were, to the old life. The cycle is true. So be gentle with yourself. Be gentle when you first release Talk to people you trust, pray, lean into the pain, stay there, and the release will come. Lean into the noise, into the pain, into the unknowns with a quiet, gentle leaning. When we lean into life's noisiness, we encounter the Spirit of God. And when we encounter the Spirit of God, inevitably we experience change and transformation and inspiration and passion and spirit-driven action. And all those things sound wonderful, but you know what? They're really uncomfortable when you're living them. They really are. And one of those uncomfortable things when you are encountering the Spirit of God, is silence. And silence is odd in our world. Being still. Silence is foreign to our daily lives, almost as much as the idea of the Spirit's indwelling. And it often takes reaching a point at which you can't do anymore. You can't think your way out of it. You can't feel your way out of it. You can't find the words or the actions or the distractions that you finally let the Spirit in. And to let the Spirit speak for us. Shut off your mind and just listen. Lean into the silence and you are leaning into the language of God. And someone who really understood the language of God is a woman by the name of Mother Julian of Norwich. She was a mystic who truly leaned into the language of God. In 1373, she became gravely ill. And she had a series of intense visions during her illness. And then she wrote and she reflected upon these visions for 20 years. And then she published a book in 1395, becoming the first woman to ever publish a book in English. And she wrote something that you maybe have heard this quote before. She wrote, All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Her struggle gave her an ability to see beyond pain and suffering and see the face of God. Julian asked in her writings, Ah, good Lord, how could all things be well because of the great harm which has come through sin to your creatures? And so our good Lord answered all the questions and doubts which I could raise, saying almost, saying most comfortingly, I make all things well, and I can make all things well. And you will see for yourself that everything kind of thing will be well. And in these words, God wishes us to be enclosed in rest and peace. And it's that reliance on the Spirit that Paul is actually talking about in Romans 8, which we just read. That all shall be well. You may have recognized kind of the second half of this text. It's Uh, often read at funerals. Often read at funerals. Nothing 
uh, what, shall, what shall we do about this? Nothing shall separate us from God. That is a beautiful text, often read at funerals. And often at funerals, if you're the one reading it, it's a bit uncomfortable when you get to verse 36. Because in amid this uh, beautiful, hopeful, aspiring text are these words. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. Bam. Well, it, it seems like a strange verse, but there actually is a, a, a reason to the, to the madness. That it actually is in there to accentuate Paul's point. It's lost on us because... We're not the audience Paul was writing to, right? He was writing to this group in Rome who would have known inside and out what we call the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, especially the Psalms. And this is a reference to Psalm 44. But generally, most of us aren't able to just go, oh, Psalm 44, you know? They just don't. But his audience would have. And so they would have known what Psalm 44 was about, right? Psalm 44 is this powerful psalm that begins with praise for the greatness of God. Oh God, you are so great. You are so powerful. You have done so many wonderful things. We just can't say enough good things about you, God. You rock. And then it moves into a lament about their condition. It says, God, you are so great, but we're being killed here. We're being led like lambs to the slaughter. And you do nothing. We've been faithful, God. We're praising you. We love you. We have followed all the commands. And we are here, your faithful people. And you are asleep, God. Seriously, this is what Psalm 44 says. In fact, it says at the end, wake up, God. (laughs) Wake up and do something. Rescue us because of our loyal love. That's how it ends. I mean, that's quite a psalm. And that's what Paul is quoting to make his strongest point. And he's doing that because what he's saying right there before, who shall separate us? He's saying, will hardship, will distress, will persecution, will famine, will nakedness. Well, all this evidence around us separate us. They're killing us. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. They're so powerful. The world is full of so many unknowns. I don't even want to get out of bed in the morning. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. There's racism and there's riots and there's pain and there's agony. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. But we're hungry. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. The point he's trying to make is that even when you are absolutely assured by everything around you, all evidence is showing that God is not with you. God is with you. That's his whole point. And all evidence shows God is not with you. God is with you. So lift up your pain. Lift up those complexities, the anger, the loneliness, the outrage, the fear, the tension, the pain. Lift it up to God. Even when you are certain, even when you don't have the words for it, and all you can do is groan, the Spirit hears that groan and lifts it up for you. For even when you are certain that all evidence points to hopelessness and amiss, that God is not with you, God is with you, for nothing will separate us from the love of God. 
So if you do find yourself in a personal crossroads right now, longing to just get things done and over with so I don't have to deal with it anymore, or the, uh, the other side of that is the uh, apathy. I just give up. Who cares? I can't change anything. Um, I have a quote for you. If you can't get out of it, get into it. Lean into the pain. Lean into it. Lean into the loudness. Lean into the silence. The Holy Spirit's driving you forward, and the Spirit only goes in one direction forward. Because everything you are, you are because of what you made through in the past. But you're going forward. So when you feel lost, you're not lost. Nothing separates us from the love of God. When you don't know where to go or what to do, God wants you to be still, to lean into the silence, and to stay in one place because God is coming to you. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. And God is a quiet God, but a strong and present God. And God knows your pain and knows what it is that will heal it. Even if you don't like what it is that will heal it, God knows nothing will separate us from the love of God. No matter how distant you may feel from God, no matter how silent God may seem to you, no matter how vacant God may feel, God wants so much for you to feel her love that he died on for you. So that is the journey. <laughs> when we go through changes and transitions, when we feel the fear, tension, pain cycle, it's a journey in which we are invited to lean into the pain and lean into the assurance that God is with you. And so I want to end with Mother Julian's words. Um, and this is what she says. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. For there is a force of love moving through the universe that holds us fast and will never let us go. Amen.
Oh, gracious God, hear now our prayer. We gather here to pray for your church, for the world, and for all in need. Shine your light upon us for understanding. Bind us together in your word that we can share your love with the world. Lord, we pray for your creation. Protect birds in their nests, fields full of crops, seas and the fish that swim in them, and inspire us also to be creation caregivers, created in your love to love your creation. We pray that you raise up just and wise advocates and judges and everywhere from small town courts to international tribunals. We pray enlightenment upon our leaders in their discernment of what is right and in doing good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, hear our prayer. God, sometimes we are filled with doubts. We wonder if you're there, if you hear us. We pray you're nurturing upon those doubts and, and that we may live in the insurance that you are there, that you are with us, and that all shall be well. We lift up those who are weak in body and mind and spirit who are struggling right now. We pray healing for the sick, comfort for the grieving, that your love may surround us, especially those who are facing their last days. Lord, we lift up especially Carol and Tony Bickle, Scott Franson, Kathy Brooks, John Calhoun, Paul Thompson, and Ron Fells. We pray expansion of understanding that we can see our neighbors as you see them, that we may expand our love for those around us. Sustain us with your Holy Spirit, the Spirit who sighs too deep for words comfort us until we rejoice when we are united with you especially those who have already united with you. We pray for the family and friends of June Horst and our sympathies. Oh Lord, into your hands we place all the prayers that we pray, those spoken, those unspoken, knowing that you hear us and you receive our prayers, trusting your mercy. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good to give our thanks and praise for this meal that Christ gave us. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
And after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we do remember. Whenever we eat and drink of this bread and cup, we remember that Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. And let us pray as Jesus taught us and remembers us in your kingdom. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. All are welcome who believe in this meal of forgiveness to receive it today. You will, we are communing by intinction, so you will receive the bread. You may dip it in either the dark liquid, which is wine, or the light liquid, which is grape juice. There are gluten-free elements available. Just let your server know, and the ushers will indicate when you can come forward, kneel, or stand along the aisle. Let us eat. This is a body. This is the blood broken and poured out for all of us. And in this communion, we share in his love. This is a body, and this is a blood.
I invite you to please stand. And now, having received this sustaining meal, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. And as you go out in the world, receive this blessing. Now may the power of God strengthen you, and may the love of Jesus Christ heal you, and may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen. Amen.